go. Yay! I've met many of you before already. Um, everybody in the room with us today. I do, um, you know, right when this uh, panel started coming together and our um, relationship with, with Concord started growing over this past year. So I said, ah, I want to moderate this. I want to be in the room with these cats. I'll be your moderator today for the, the conversation. But I was lucky to have a friend at work at the label at Concord many years ago and introduced me to the spectacular breadth and depth of Concord's catalog. Um, the team that I've met here today with us today and I've met over the years at Concord are some of the most passionate and dedicated uh, folks. The history, the present, as well as the future of music. So today we're going to be discussing the details, trends, and career pathways and labels. And we're joined by some of the industry's top leaders in this space. So let's begin with our panelists. Uh, we're going to do introductions. You guys do very quick introductions at first. Michelle, why don't we start with you? Just tell us a little bit about yourself and your role in the industry. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you for having me and us. Um, my name is Michelle Smith. I am the Vice President of Estate and Legacy Brand Management. I come from marketing and product management. My role in the industry, my, my position is a unique position. I work in the catalog department, but I oversee the estates of Billie Holiday, Tammy Wynette, and I also oversee the brand of Stax Records. Stax Records is a label out in, um, was a label between 1967 and 1975. Um, right now, on the actual uh, location of where Stax was in Memphis, Tennessee, sits a museum, a charter school, and a music academy. So as Concord's representative, I sit on that board as well. So I have a very unique and different role, um, but my history in the music industry, I started out as an intern. I came from Canada. I've worked in music my whole career. Um, I've worked with many different labels, from Virgin to MCA to... Um, Perspective Records, which was Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, uh, Hidden Beats. I've worked for in many, many different roles. So I look forward to this discussion. Um, feel free to ask any questions. Everyone's journey is different. Um, and what you start out in is not what you end up doing. So awesome. Excellent. Andrew. Hey, everyone. I'm Andrew Wallace. I'm a VP streaming and brand partnerships for Concord. Um, I oversee our entire uh, streaming marketing department and spearhead the artist rosters for partnership opportunities. Um, I've been at Concord five year, about five years. And before that, I was I started my career actually as a music programmer at Apple Music um, coming over from Beats Music. Um, and I was handling um, both indie music and electronic music. So I have an interesting perspective on both sides of the table here, having worked actually at a streaming service and on the label side. So happy to be here, happy to answer any of your questions as well. And I look, I look forward to uh, the panel. Brilliant, and Rebecca, take us home. Hi, my name is Rebecca Berman. I am the SVP of International for Concord Recorded Music. So I oversee the international marketing campaigns for all artists signed across our five frontline labels, um, as well as the catalog. So, um, it's a it's a pretty diverse role. I I, I kind of get my I like to call it sort of a label within a label because I work sales, streaming, marketing, radio, press, promotion, everything outside of the United States. Um, so it's a really exciting role to be in, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to you guys about it. So you guys touched a little bit on this this sort of first question I I have today, which is um, the core of your work, right? This label services and. And, and as the, the, the industry keeps shifting, it's really, why are labels important these days? I know it's a really big question, um, but um, Andrew, want to jump in and, and yeah, I think, have at this? I think, you know, from my, from my perspective, I think historically, a lot of artists have, you know, at least going back to the 60s and 70s and 80s, labels were seen as kind of like a bank account. And I think now more than ever, we like to consider ourselves artist advocates and it's our jobs to figure out ways as a marketing arm for the artists to help drive their careers. And something like, you know, with, with label services specifically, 
you know, it's it's we are we are an extension of the artist and the artist management team, and we really like to work hand in hand together internally and externally with the management to make sure that we are servicing them as best we can. So I think you know if if you're an artist who is independent, by all means, that's awesome. Um, but you know when you when you sign to a label like Concord, you have a breadth of knowledge that you would not have yourself, and there's just things you simply cannot do on your own and cannot accomplish on your own, and that's that's okay. And I think that that takes that takes time, and you know I think it's it's something that's really uh, important to drive your career. Yeah, if I could just step in there, I think also, you know, speaking from the international department, I think launching an artist globally is something that would be very difficult to do on your own. We have not only are we distributed by Universal, so we have access to the, the leverage of a gigantic music company, but we've built our own global infrastructure. So we have dedicated Concord people in the UK, Germany, Japan, Australia, Canada, all of which that help oversee kind of our artist campaigns globally. And I think that's something that would be very difficult to do on your own and not necessarily the goal of every artist, but I think it really offers artists long-term careers when you can sort of tour the world and have a fan base um, outside of the United States. And if I could jump in there as well, I mean, coming from a marketing uh, product management where you work one-on-one -on -one with an artist, I had an artist in the past that, that decided to go independent and not be signed with a label and called about six, eight, a year later and said, Michelle, I did not even realize which, what a label really does for me. And he had been an artist for decades. And he said, it is so difficult now as independent because you guys covered so much and did so much and had the relationships that I now have to build. Yeah. So it was quite interesting to see the difference for someone who had been signed to many labels for many years and then did the independent route. Excellent. I know you guys talked about this a little bit in your introductions, but you have very distinct roles inside of a label, uh, inside of Concord specifically. And, and again, you know, it's, it's what we're trying to tease out for all the young people here today and, and throughout our programs is all the varied aspects. Um, you know, it's not just, oh, I wanna work at a label. What does that mean, right? Because there's so many different paths. Um, I'd love for you guys to talk about your role that you play inside. I know, again, you touched on this a little bit in your intros, but but specifically, um, um, and um, you know, what are the skills necessary for you in your role to be as successful as possible, right? Rebecca, we're going to start internationally with you to touch on on that role again, um, and then the skills that you, you touch on every day that you that you need to continue to to build and grow for your role. Yeah. So, like I said, I have a very broad role, and I think as as the head of the department, a lot of what I've done um, of late is really building up the infrastructure so we know we're servicing our artists as best we can around the world. So hiring great people in markets around the world, knowing what it takes to be a, to have launch a successful campaign in Japan versus Canada versus Australia. Um, so I think, I mean, let me rewind. The first thing is a love of music. I mean, I think that's where we all start. And that's what is unbelievably necessary because as stressful as my job can get, I'm working in music. So there, are, I, I very rarely do not love my job. Um, so it's a love of music. It's following kind of maybe a path of the kind of music that you love. Concord's a very diverse label. We work across a ton of different genres, but we're not really in the chasing hits top 40 business. So, you know, obviously Universal has a bunch of labels that are, there are major labels that are very much in that business. We're more in the niche artist business. And it's something that I am really drawn to have tried to do my whole career is work within sort of more niche genres than the top 40 genre. So I think a love of music, maybe following the type of music that you love and trying to get a career within that. Um, for international specifically, I think um, cultural understanding, empathy, a love of travel. Um, I, you know, when I first started, I started at Warner uh, Brothers Records in the international department. And within a few weeks, I was sent on a three-day trip flying to Japan, Hong Kong, and Australia just to deliver a watermarked version of the Madonna record. This, this is <laughs> years, years ago, this doesn't happen anymore, um, to the heads of the, the labels in each country. Um, and it was a little bit terrifying. I was, you know, 
in my mid twenties, getting sent on an airplane for three days, you know, to, to countries I had never been to, but super, super exciting. So for international specifically, I think you need to be able to think very broadly um, while also being able to get in the weeds of marketing campaigns. But it's in, in different countries around the world. It's a, it's a different uh, mindset in each country and that really requires a cultural understanding as well. All right, sensitivity and uh, to all that. Excellent, yes. Andrew. Yeah, so um, I echo a lot of what Rebecca says, um, but you know, so within within the label, uh, it's my responsibility to drive streaming consumption for our music and our artist roster, as well as work hand in hand with each label and with you know departments like Rebecca's department. Like streaming is a very global thing, so we need to make sure on a day to day basis we're in communication, talking, making sure we're on the same page, because you know we we like to consider ourselves like a well oiled machine, and without that, you know, we we can't function. Um, you know, so I'm really looking for ways with the rest of the team to strategically, you know, find ways to drive audio consumption, especially during this time of COVID where, you know, the typical audio consumption habits are not the same. There's not people in their car as much, you know, listening to the radio. So, but where are those people and how can we capture them? So, you know, you look at things like Peloton and the Calm app and all these, all these other audio sources that we wouldn't think of as a typical DSP like Spotify or Apple. Um, but it's, it's really thinking strategically outside of the box. Um, so necessary skills, um, I would say passion, ear to the ground, um, really analytical thinking. Um, communication is very important um, and time management. This is not your typical nine to five, you know, like we're it's really it's been really difficult for me, especially during this time. Candidly, is that like my office is in my living room, you know, so like I have a hard time separating work from work from life. But at the same time, I love what I do like this. It's even in normal times, like when I go out to a show at nine, 10 o'clock at night, that would be fun for me in a normal time. I get to go, you know, I get to go and hang out with my coworkers and it's quote unquote work, but it's still fun. So I think, you know, again, not your typical nine to five. I think, you know, if you, if you pack it in at five o'clock, you're probably, you know, I, I think you can do okay, but like you really have to have that passion to, you know, kind of, be, kind of just keep going, um, you know, take calls. We need to take calls, go out when you need to go out and, Again, we work in music. We're, we're very lucky and very blessed, and uh, I don't take that for granted at all. I love that. I love that. All right, Michelle. Well, I will echo what both Rebecca and Andrew said. However, mine is very different because I come from product management, which is kind of the hub of um, a projects because uh, you're working with the artist once they leave the studio. But now I work in catalog, so I have to switch my brain from product management to brand management looking at the bigger picture overall as I take um, oversee a brand. So it's different there in the sense that um, I'm looking more at big picture opposed to the day-to-day -day granular portions of a project. Um, but what is so interesting, and I think everyone touched on it, is none of us um, do the same thing every day. It changes every day. Um, and that's what the excitement is. Uh, you never know, it's like a box of chocolates, you know, uh, Forrest Gump, you never know what you're gonna get. It changes every day. And I think not only that, for my role, um, I now work in legacy. So I have to be sensitive to estates. I have to be sensitive to needs. Um, I have to look at history and overall the historical legacy of a, a, a label or a person. I have to look at their individual history and how it ties back into revenue, how to monetize it. So, and one thing that's also interesting is Concord's just not a record company. Concord is an entertainment company. So I get to work with film and television. I get to work with the theatrical division, which is awesome because, you know, right now in my role, I'm working on a musical with the theatrical division. I'm working on a docu-series and scripted television with our film and TV departments. So it's things that I did not enter the industry in. And I've been a music person for however many years, but now I get to work in theatrical and film and television. And that's exciting to me because it changes every day and it stretches me because it's areas that I don't know. So you have to have humility to ask questions. You have to um, be entrepreneurial because a lot of times you've got to figure it out. And that's what um, all businesses are, honestly. So I'm just, it, it's exciting every day, like my colleagues say, because we are, we are blessed to work in this industry. We are blessed. Yeah, I just want to emphasize, uh, I think, what you, you were saying around, um, you know, staying, you didn't say, but it's staying curious. Uh, our, our industry is shifting 
so much faster than so many other industries that we know. Um, and especially the past year and a half, how, how just dynamic it's been. And if you don't stay on top of those trends, and it may not even be trends in the music industry, it may be trends in other industries that are starting to come in, right? And, and impact you, you have to stay on top. Um, and even someone, you know, um, all of us who've been in, in the industry, some of you guys for decades, it's, you're still learning. Right, you never stop, which which I which I love. I know you touched on this, Michelle, about all the other industries that the label interacts with and, and influences film, TV, radio, touring, all that stuff. Can you touch a bit on that a little bit more? You just expand on that, Michelle, on how the label um, impacts and imprints and, and and how it connects with those uh, other industries. Well, we also have to think about um, an artist is always growing and expanding. So even if they just do music, they may want to do film and TV. We have to look at other areas that we can synergy. And a lot of companies, Concord is very unique because a lot of companies do not are not synergistic. So they do not allow their film and television to work with their recording industry, their recording side or whatnot, where we are very holistic. So we look at different areas and aspects, whether it is the touring side to radio, television, film, uh, international, we make sure that we are firing on all cylinders so that we are growing. Remember, we are in the background of making other people, um, uh, 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 I, I, let's say famous, okay? So we are helping them to uh, grow their artistry. So we're in the background thinking about ways that we can help grow them, their career, their artistry. So um, we have to be, and that's why Andrew, Rebecca, and I, when we first jumped on, we're like, I miss you because we don't get to have those, <clears throat> excuse me, those office sidebar conversations when you happen to run into people in the hallway going, hey, I heard you're doing this. What about this for this artist? Um, so, and that's where we're moving globally. You cannot be in a silo. You have to be, you think of everything globally, whether it is frontline recorded music, whether it is catalog, because once they leave frontline, they become catalog. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the area where I work. And then also what Andrew's doing is so important because of streaming, it's global. That's where content is. That's where everyone is going today. So um, we're very fortunate that we, as a, a entertainment company, look at the industry holistically and we work together. Yeah, I mean, I just, one thing that's really, really important on the label side that is not something that we're always necessarily in control over is obviously like sync licensing. And that's global as well. You could get a massive car ad in Italy and that can break an artist there. Um, so we do have sync people within our company, but we really rely on music supervisors and people who sort of choose the music for advertising, television, film, you know, to also drive our campaigns. I mean, I wouldn't say actually we rely on it. It's, it happens to be, it's like a stroke of luck when it happens. Um, you know, it, it's hard to guarantee that you can get anything like that, but that can make a huge difference in our artist campaigns around the world. Yeah, now, and now there's just so much access to data that we have and collectively know how to uh, investigate, I guess you could say. And, you know, for instance, when, if there is a sync in like Spain, we can see that a song is, you know, Shazam wise is going, is, you know, is, is rising there. So we, then we kind of dig into it because sometimes, you know, especially in Europe, there's blanket license for sync. Um, and so we don't know, sometimes we don't know that there's a sync there. And then we have to kind of, we see that we can go figure it out why, and then we can tie it back to streaming and then it's a whole holistic effort. So Andrew sends me an email saying the Shazam's just spiked in Barcelona, you know, on, you know, sort of uh, on Rye or on, you know, Sylvanesso. Like, do we know why? And so then, and, and me as running the international department, sometimes I have no idea why. But the cool thing is I can then go to my team in Spain or, you know, my team out of the UK that, that oversees Europe and say, what's going on? And then we find out that, you know, Sylvanesso got played on Love Island and it had impact in Spain. Um, so it's, it's, you know, the data is definitely, I think it's something that we would be remiss if we didn't touch on because that's been a huge change from when I entered the music industry till now. I mean, it used to be sound scan was the only data you had and that was, you know, North America only. And you could see where physical records were shipping, but that was about it. Now you have data on every streaming site, you know, where it's coming from, how many you have, it, you know, you can break it down geographically. You know, Universal provides us access to their platforms, which, you know, they have entire data analysts and specialists. 
And so it becomes some, somewhat more scientific than it did when I began. But on the creative side, you have to really know what data is important and what to look for, because it could be too overwhelming to even delve into. So I think there's an analysis side of your brain that really is more important now than ever. Um, and one that had I known when I was back in college, maybe I would have uh, focused on a little bit more. Um, but it, there is an overwhelming amount of data and how you use it has become very important in the music industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's interesting how, you know, I even look at, at, at live entertainment companies often are data driven, but there's still something about that gut feeling that, you you know, it's, it, you have to have a bit of a, a balance. And when you decide to, to lean into an artist or, or, you know, I know there's a there's a question on the table here from Cameron Smith. Um, a student in Lafayette, Louisiana, about getting their foot into the door of a major label. So I'd love for you guys to talk a bit about whether a young, a young a, an aspiring artist in, in the room here or a young professional, what are you looking for? Um, and how do they get noticed? How do they, take, they get noticed at Concord? Are we talking about as an artist or as an employee? Well, I gave you both. So yeah. you can you you can um, to look at it um, from, from both aspects. And I know that there are some Concord HR professionals uh, swimming through today as well out here. But um, for, for this team, you guys can, for both aspiring and, and also, I mean, you know, coordinators you want to bring onto your teams too. Yeah, Just from, I guess I could, I could tackle this. From, from, a, from an employee standpoint, you know, for me, if I go back to how I got into it, I just remember being in college and like every time there was a music opportunity, I raised my hand and I just did it. Like I, I volunteered on campus to bring, you know, to hand out like street flyers for the local shows. I helped bring bands to campus. I worked at like a music blog. I did literally anything I could, especially because I was in a town where there wasn't a lot of music. Um, and then I ended up getting an internship at iTunes, you know, in Cupertino on the Apple campus. So I, I, got, I got lucky. But it was also just because I was—I always had my eyes and ears to the ground looking, um, and things don't happen right away. But you know, you just keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. And I think the big thing um, for me that I didn't understand earlier in my career is that like networking, especially in the music industry, is so 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 key. And you know, you don't know. For instance, for me, when I interned at iTunes, I had so I, I made you know I had like my boss and I had these connections, but I was young. I didn't really know how to foster them. And then five six years down the line, I was or three, four years down the line, I was working at Beats, Apple buys Beats, those coworkers I had when I was an intern were my coworkers again, and I hadn't bothered to keep up with them. And that was like, oh, and that was a really major realization point for me. I was like, dang, like if only I kept up with them, like I would have, you know, this great, great relationship. And uh, yeah, it was, it, that was a really, it was, it was very powerful for me. Um, in this industry, everybody knows everybody. So like, even, you know, just I never burn a bridge, like always, you know, just stay, uh, if, if you if you can like you know call your coworkers call your you know call your friends in the industry get a mentor um I, i've had several great mentors in my career from all paths of the industry and that's really helped me um and i guess that's a that's a long-winded answer on the employee side on the a and r side that's a re it's really interesting uh because you know like you said the data is so you know important but at the same time there is that gut feeling especially from an old school a and r standpoint you can't beat the gut feeling and sometimes that, you know, like sometimes the sound is what's going to be the sound of tomorrow and data won't tell you that data can tell you what's popping off now. And I think a lot of major labels, you know, have these analytical tools that can determine when a band's going to pop, going to break out. But that's very immediate. That's like, oh, this song's going to, you know, have 100,000 plays by tomorrow and we've got to go sign them. But that may not have a long, that may not have a long lasting effect. Something that goes viral on TikTok has like a 48 hour shelf life. Um, so, you know, in, in Concord, especially, I think, you know, we're, we want to help develop an artist's career. We don't, we don't want like a one-off, you know, one hit wonder type of thing. We, we, if we're going to invest our time and our money and, you know, in, in our collective efforts as a team, we want to make sure that we're helping develop the artist's career. And, you know, I, I did, I just, you know, it's really the thing that I love the most about working in music is like taking an artist from, from, you know, the bottom to the top and knowing that I had a part in that and it's, it's, it's great. Rebecca and Michelle. I just wanted to pipe in really quickly. One really cool thing that kind of has changed, certainly COVID has changed it, but I think culture has changed it as well, is I did a lot of internships leading into my career, but I was lucky enough to have been born and raised in LA. I didn't have to move somewhere to, to get those internships. Back in the day, some of mine paid, which they stopped paying for a while. I think there's a, a realization in the industry that we're really limiting ourselves and the talent pool. If you have to live in LA or New York or Nashville, 
and if work, you're expected to work for free. And I think COVID has really allowed, we had an intern that we loved. And when COVID happened, she went back to Florida where she was from. We kept her on through all of COVID because you know we weren't in the office. Why does somebody else need to be in the same city as we are? And she killed it. So I think there's more opportunity now than ever. So don't be discouraged if you're not in New York or LA, reach out to HR teams, apply for internships, because I think we all realize that we're not gonna succeed um, as a company at Concord, if we can't make sure that we have a much larger pool of talent. But it's also tenacity, I think is what you also shared because I came out as an internship and I'm from Canada originally. And I used to call companies and say, hey, can I intern for you? And I ended up back in the day working 50 hours a week because being Canadian, I had no work papers. I only had a student visa, 50 hours a week for free, right? But in one month I got two job offers because they got to see how I worked, what my integrity and my character were like, and that's how you got job offers. I think you don't quit. You, if there's something that you wanna do, you keep fighting for it. And Rebecca is so right. You don't have to be, it, everything is virtual now pretty much. Um, so it's that, it's that tenacity. I also think because I mentor a lot of students through Stax Music Academy on an artist side, you have to be in the business of your own business if you want to, um, just going back to the question that you asked, as an artist that wants to be discovered or signed by a major label, you have to be in the business of your own business. So what are you doing to make yourself um, seen, recognized? Yes, you might be on social media platforms, but also remember what you post or how you post is going to be seen by someone that you want to influence or you want someone to um, uh, possibly sign you. So you also have to be um, cognizant and um, be aware of what you are posting that may not be musical as well. And I say this to the students, you know, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So what you are posting and how you post it, who your friends are and how you tag them and what you say can come back to bite you as we've seen in the music industry in the last few years. So you have to be very cognizant of what you are doing if you want to attract those in a career atmosphere um, to see your work. Yeah, thank you guys so much for that discussion. Um, we're gonna jump into our Q&A from our students. Jessica wants to know, how were you able to build the skills in order for you guys to have your position within the industry? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you look like you're thinking, but I mean, I, I think something that's been said already is how much our industry changes mm -hmm. constantly. So you can never get complacent that you know what you're doing, mm -hmm. especially when you work in marketing, because when you work in marketing, you have to go where the audience is and that's changing so constantly. So obviously, like if you're talking about now, like TikTok is obviously a big platform where we're finding a lot of, you know, artists that are breaking through. That said, the, the vinyl business has exploded over the last two years. So you can't move on from physical entirely because, you know, we've got streaming and TikTok. So Wait, it's I heard Ringo Starr's the thing he's selling the most is cassettes. His la latest EP, I was like, cassettes, guys. Yes, cassettes we're, doing, we're actually doing cassettes on a number of our artists. Um, but yes, I mean, so I think it's, you have to just be, as I think Andrew used, finger on the pulse, you know, you, uh, constantly nimble and learning and never, you know, I'm 45 years old, you know, I, I, I used to be super hip and be at shows all the time and reading all the blogs and knowing everything. And it's like, you, you can't, decide that you you know you've moved on from that you really have to know what's going on in our industry to stay viable and to move up within the executive ranks but and and also you have to be willing to ask the questions you know no one knows everything you can't know everything so it's willing to learn it's willing to be observant of what other people are doing what works for them what doesn't work for them and how you may be able to apply it to what you are doing as well so um i think it's never thinking that you've arrived because you haven't it's also being um uh, uh, honestly, like I think Andrew said, his colleagues worked, you know, when a company was purchased or he, he went to another company, people he used to work with are now his colleagues. It's not burning bridges. It's, um, it's just really being cognizant of what is going on in the industry and who you may be working with tomorrow because you never know. Every day is a little bit different. Yeah, and I, I completely echo both what Michelle and Rebecca have said. I think a lot of, a lot of this really is trial by error, but, you know, not being afraid to raise your hand and ask a question mm -hmm. uh, and really constantly reading. For me, I always have, you know, like music business worldwide, digital music news, all these all these things, constantly reading about what's next, what's happening, you know, and I touched on this earlier, but like thinking like my job is streaming, but thinking outside just the typical DSP box, 
um, looking at all these platforms where people may be consuming music. Um, so that touches on think, having finger on the pulse of just, you know, constantly learning. I think just always having that tenacity to learn and keep going. And like some days may be hard and some days are going to be great, uh, but that's that's part of the fun. Perfect. Well, since we're on the topic of, you know, what characteristics and skills do you have to have? Um, a few students are asking, um, how do you actually find a mentor? Um, how do you get in contact with someone? How should you approach someone? I mean, I think there's a lot of different ways. And I think, as everyone has said, like tenacity is a big part of it. I've been approached, you know, on LinkedIn, you know, by somebody else who went to the University of Michigan. Um, so, you know, and it, you might not hear back from a lot of people, but, I, you know, you keep trying to find ways. I mean, obviously, interning is a huge way of finding mentors. I've stayed in touch with many of my interns over the years, many of whom have incredibly successful careers now. Um, so I, I definitely think that is a key way going to panels, reaching out to people after the panel, saying, I liked what you were talking about. I'm interested in your career. Um, you know, I, I you, you kind of have to like spread out your tendrils everywhere and try to find your entry point. I, I took a workshop on theatrical uh, film, sorry, theatrical stage production. And there was a producer of a Broadway show who happened to speak for 10 minutes. And I cold called her and said, hey, I was in this workshop. I don't see a lot of female producers in theatrical Broadway can I speak to you? And she's like, her door is now open to me. I can call her anytime I have questions. You just have to, if it's, if it's fear, put it aside because that's false evidence appearing real, you know, put it aside and just make the call, you know, um, it's how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? So you make the call and, and that doesn't change when you are a VP or SVP, you still have to have that um, spirit of entrepreneurship. I've got to make this happen. You know, um, how do I how do I do that? I mean, I'm in a role now where I oversee estates, you know, where I have to look at the legacy of Billy Holiday and Tammy Wynette. And I have to figure out new ways and licensing opportunities for for these le legendary women. I didn't grow up thinking about Tammy Wynette and Billy Holiday, but I have to make it happen. So how do I do that? So. Yeah, and Concord actually offers, it's really great we do this, we have like an internal mentorship program where even if, I think even if you're a VP level, you can get partnered with someone at like a C-level C position. Or if you're a coordinator, you can get partnered with someone who's a director. And this, you know, I think we, I don't, I don't think we've done this during COVID, but pre-COVID we, we were doing this and I thought it was a really cool um, internal program we have. But, you know, even going back to like my first industry mentor, my first mentor was this guy, my mom, my mom's a travel agent and she did his travel once and found out he was in music and then I just gave him a call. So it's like, it's, it's, it's these weird like chance opportunities, but you know, echoing what Rebecca and Michelle have said is like, you know, don't be afraid to just pick up a phone and call, use LinkedIn. There's so many different platforms now where you can find people and like find a common bond. Like you know, going back to what Rebecca said, like I've had people hit me up who went to Cal Poly and I think that's cool. You know, like I think, you know, especially because Cal Poly was a place like I mentioned earlier in the chat was that there wasn't a lot of music there. So when I find someone who went there that, you know, wants to be in music, I see myself in that. So again, finding that common bond is important and yeah, just keep trying, keep going. Awesome. And I see lots of questions coming in on internships specifically. Um, music Forward, we're, we're actually doing a couple of internship opportunities with Concord um, and have a page, a career page on our website of internship and opportunities. But it's, it's also you want to be ready for it so that, that you want to make sure that your resume is ready, that you're ready to be in an interview, that you know how to pitch yourself. And throughout the day to day, we've got some of those office hour um, career readiness workshops, as well as not only during All Access Fest. So keep connected to um, some of the work that Music Forward is and, and look at those um, application opportunities for internships, because um, not only through Music Forward, but Concord on their own, you find a company that you like keep following them, track them, because they will announce when they have internships available. Go to their website. It's, uh, this is like very old school, but go to their website and at the very bottom, oh. it's careers. Yes. You know, you love, you know, Sony, you love, you know, Matador Records. Like go, it's, it'll say careers and oftentimes it'll tell you if there's an internship or an entry level job or something like that available uh, among mm -hmm. the other job sites that, that are there, but sometimes go directly to the source. Well, so in and going back to, you know, when I got my first internship at Apple, I got that because I applied to a random job at Apple because there, there was that job was not posted on my college job board. I went to my college job board, applied to a random job at Apple. 
the recruiter saw my resume and was like, oh, I think you'd be way better at this job. I didn't think about posting it here because I didn't think anybody would be interested. I got the job. So don't don't be afraid, with, especially with larger companies. Those recruiters often you know, recruit for many different positions. Um, and that's just a way to get in their in their ear and get them to, to uh, pay attention. And don't be afraid of a phone. I think a lot of people are afraid of a phone nowadays. I yep. mean, back in the day, we picked up the phone and I said, hi, can I intern for you? It doesn't matter what department. I just want to intern. And I interned in A&R and in press, rock A&R and, um, and in press. You know? And one thing I want to say about internship, and this follows you in your career, an internship, be willing to do anything. And what I mean by that is that's legal and moral. And, you know, but what I mean by that is I worked two internships, A&R and publicity, and it didn't matter what it was. Got it. If you want me to do a 1500 uh, mailer, do it. You know what I mean? Because you learn so much and you research and you read as you are doing it because you're learning so much as you're doing that position. Because when you get into the work world, just because you have a title or you have a job description doesn't mean you're not going to do things outside of that. Because I think one thing at Concord is no one says that's not my job. If you need to get it done, you get it done. So that's not my job is not part of a vocabulary. So it is about getting the end result of being successful in whatever that task is. That's awesome. Okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit and jump back into data. So Tyler Petty wants to know how do you use data that how do you use the data that you look for is it to protect against infringement is it to look for potential revenue what do you suggest others keep in mind when interpreting so much with data very loaded question <laughs> there's a lot there yeah. andrew looks like he's thinking yeah, I, so I mean, we, yeah go ahead no go ahead andrew i, I was gonna uh, i was gonna tap dance until you were ready yeah. i mean for me the data the, you know, there's just, there's so many different platforms with data, right? Like we look at Nielsen, we look at Next Big Sound, we look at Spotify for Artists, we look at, uh, we have an internal dashboard uh, that we look at that pulls in all sorts of data, right? So it's, it's, I'm not sure if this answers the question, but it's figuring out a way to marry all of those things and then really drive consumption and ultimately drive revenue because that that is that is our job. And I think if anything, like it's also interesting from an artist standpoint where I can see that like, you know, random artist A is taking off in, you know, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And the artist may not know that, and they may have ne never toured in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And that, and then, you know, this, this actually happened with one of our bands several years ago, where they, I think it was some a, a, a market in Utah where they found that they were actually streaming really well in Utah. And they ended up adding a show to their tour in Utah and they sold it out. And they would have had no idea. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that it, that yeah, that because I, mean, I, I think on the marketing side, it's finding where there may be an audience that you were unaware of, or where there may be impact in doing uh, in initiating some sort of marketing campaign, whether it's getting a sync or whether uh, a tour date actually sort of really spiked your consumption, so that you know touring is a good driver for your music. Um, you know, it's it's sort of being able to craft a narrative that we can then learn lessons from and then implement to say, well, this this is obviously working and we, we need to do more of this. Or I have an artist that was on a TV show in France and it didn't move the needle at all. And it cost a bunch of money and it was, you know, it was hard to get there and, you know, it was a slog. And, oh, OK, well, that TV show didn't move the needle at all for that artist. So, you know, it's 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 figuring things like that out. I think you also mentioned, you know, copyright infringement, things like that, there are, you know, being distributed by a large company like Universal, they have teams of people that are constantly doing the takedowns of anything that is copyright infringement. And that's, you know, that is part of the job. But we as marketing people generally are using that data. And if you're interested in being at a label on the marketing side, is using that data to learn lessons about what is worth doing, what isn't worth doing, where you should be chasing your audience and, and things like that. I can give an example of that. For example, at the start of the pandemic, uh, we were doing a campaign on gospel truth at Stacks, and it said, and data came back that people were going for more gospel music. So we were advised to maybe put it out more of gospel truth. Well, in the end result, when we saw the data, the more we put out, it was hurting the brand because they were looking at his. They wanted historical Stacks, not just gospel, which was one genre. So now this is a year later where we've ended up getting our subscribers back because we're, we're creating a whole bunch of content that is across the board for Stacks opposed to just gospel. 
So when our campaign ended, we saw where it worked and where it didn't work and how we had to shift gears and how we're shifting the gears and we're now um, surpassing where we were, but we had to really look at the data to see what was going on, what, what was working, what was not working. So you can use it in many, many different ways. So. Just really quickly, I know this is, this, there's just so much on this, but Andrew, I think it, it's really interesting and maybe people don't know what like the back end of Spotify can tell you as far yeah. as people skipping songs, how long they listen to a song. And we talked yeah. about that. There's, there's, I mean, Spotify for artists, Apple Music for artists, all these, these DSP backends, super, super valuable. A lot of the information they keep close to chest, but a lot of it is actually, you know, public. If you, if you're an artist and you get uh, verified on platform, which is, which is not that difficult, you can, you can see all this data. You can see where your streams are coming from. You can see where you, how many streams you're getting within a playlist. You can see that your song, you know, one of your songs may be taking off on algorithmic radio. I think especially, you know, with streaming, so much is going algorithmic versus editorial that it's really, really great to see this stuff. Um, and, you know, you can, see, you can see breakdowns over like, I'm getting, you know, 20% of my streams are coming from profile, 15% are coming from library, 10% are coming from editorial playlists. And it's just really, over time, you'll see like what is actually most effective for you. And, you know, when, when my stream rate goes from, you actually want your editorial stream rate to go down and your library stream rate to go up because that means people are finding are finding your music on say a playlist then saving it to their library and then listening to it and becoming a fan and that's it's super super cool um you need to go see like monthly listeners how many followers you have you can get the ratio between that um you know and so that it's it's really cool yes okay as we close out because we are wrapping up what is one piece of advice you guys would give to students so it can be anything. <laughs> um, my thing, I think as a woman in the music industry who also has a, a fairly young child, I think um, work hard, but that doesn't mean don't create a work-life balance and have your boundaries because that's something that I kind of wish I had been told more. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important, you know, I think for men and women to create those boundaries and, you know, know that you're doing your job well and you're working really hard, but that doesn't necessarily mean you need to be working 20 hours a day. I also say, would say as a person of color in the music industry that you have to stay true to yourself. There will be times when you come up against various different uh, situations. Um, always hold your head up high <laughs> and um, walk in integrity and character, but also in truth. And um, also, as we've said before, uh, things change every day, be a part of the good part of the changes, not a part of the bad part of the changes, and just work hard and have fun. And know that a lot of people would love your job, so do, so do it to the best of your ability, because there's a lot of people behind you who would love to take your, your position. So do it to the best of your ability. I echo all of that. Um, and I think, you know, I've touched on this earlier, but just networking, raising your hand, you know, you know, uh, just making sure you're, you're not burning any bridges. Um, cause you never know, you never know who you're going to meet down the line again that can, you know, help you out or, uh, get you to where you need to be. Um, and just being passionate, being like being, being a voracious music fan, going to shows, you know, listening, listening to new stuff. It's just, it's, it's it can't be understated. Okay. Nalini, I totally want to jump in for one more question for them. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not following the rules clearly. Um, Andrew, Michelle, Rebecca, what projects are you currently working on right now that you're most excited about that you want to share with everybody? Hmm. Oh, back to people one. I won. Okay, so the 50th anniversary of Watt Stacks, which was a festival in Los Angeles 50 years ago next year, is coming up. And um, during COVID, I was working with a producer to see if we could restage it for next year. My goal and my hope is that we will do a two-day festival in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Coliseum that will have social justice as well as a two-day music con uh, a music festival. We're in the middle of COVID. I don't know if it's going to be a reality, to be honest. However, um, that is one of the projects I've been working on. And if it does become reality, from my lips to God's ears, and um, we'll see how it goes. Um, I can just give you a, a sense of the breadth of what we're doing. We have a young artist who's a brand new signing uh, named Milo. His name's Bobby, but he's an artist named Milo. Total up and coming, but he does sort of bedroom pop. It's musically really speaks to me. And I'm excited to see his career grow sort of from the very beginning onward. 
we also just recently started for Fears and we're putting out their first record in 17 years. So I'm also working a band that I grew up with that was like really important in sort of, I think a lot of the 80s and 90s kids childhood, putting out their first record in 17 years and they're legends. So I, I love the breadth of what we're doing and those are two projects that I'm really excited about. Yep. Same, same for me on, on Milo and Tears of Fears, but not, another one to add on top of that is um, Artist Ghost. I think it's been really, really fun to work this project. We just uh, released a new song today, actually. And um, it was maybe three years ago, we all went to the forum and just, it's really fun to go see a show live and just watch the crowd get so into an artist that you had a hand, you know, helping get to that stage in a way, you know? So it's it's really cool now now to see an artist sell out the forum and now we're just releasing new music for the first time in a couple of years. And now it's that, now where can that take them, you know, a year from now? It's the sky's kind of the limit. So it's fun. It's fun to watch the career trajectory of a project that you've been working on for years. All right, perfect. Well, let's all give our panelists a virtual round of applause and some exclamation marks over in the chat emojis. Thank you guys so much for having us and joining us today. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm alone, so gone. You're under my skin. I'm losing it. No, I'm through.